Hi, I'm Bella Dad, and we're going to make some Neapolitan inspired pizza for the home oven today. So, first thing we're going to discuss before we get going um, on, this, on the board here, we've got our baker's percentage. One of the things I want to talk about for this is the Neapolitan inspired pizza. It's a little different than your traditional pizza um, that you'd consider Neapolitan. Uh, there's a lot of tradition that goes with the Neapolitan pizza, and we're going to try to stay true to that as much as possible. However, since we're using some different ingredients, and we're using a home oven, we're gonna to have to take a slight turn from the traditional way of making it. So this is a Neapolitan inspired pizza for the home oven. Here I have the baker's percentage for this recipe. You're going to be using that a lot. It uh, allows you to vary the amount of pizza you make in the future if you like this recipe. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to get your on baking book ready. This is what we're gonna be using here. Um, a lot of we're going to reference it a lot. All the pages are set up here as well too about some of the things we're going to discuss. We're not going to go into definitions. We're just going to point them out as we talk about them and you guys can go in there and look that up. So get a notebook handy, a calculator helps out, a pencil, and your on baking book. So let's talk about the way we're set up here today. This is your grams. These are your ingredients. Everything's based on the flour amount. The total amount of flour in your recipe is your 100% point. Everything else from there is adjusted to that flour amount. We're gonna make six pizzas today in the dough that we make at 250, gram, 250 grams each pizza. So that is the basics when it comes to that. Here's a little bit more clarification on that. But once again, you can go to pages 127 through 129 and you'll read about the baker's percentage. So with that being said, let's jump into equipment so we can start making dough and start making pizza and start eating pizza. Here is a breakdown of some of the equipment you're gonna need whenever you're making pizza at home. This is a blue steel type pan um, used a lot in the Detroit style pizza and deep dish Chicago style somewhat as well too. Quality pans make quality pizza. The next thing that every home pizza chef needs to make or needs to get is their pizza pans, pizza steels, all right? This is a pizza stone right here. This is a ceramic pizza stone. In my opinion, cutting corners at this stage um, is, is not worth it. I recommend investing in good pizza stones. Ceramic are fantastic. It's really what they're made out of is gonna determine how good they are. You don't wanna work on doughs, and sauces and then on the back end when you cook your pizza cut a corner and then lose your pizza because you have a poor piece of equipment to make your pizza on this is a cast iron version it's about a 14 inch these are great um, the cast iron and pizza steels have kind of taken the home pizza scene by storm over the last couple of years these are fantastic um, really durable if they start rusting a little bit here and there, you just throw a little bit of oil on there, you heat them back up, and they're ready to go. Another version of a pizza steel is an actual baking steel. Much heavier, much more durable, takes a little bit longer to heat up, but it retains its heat um, significantly better. They are more expensive, so it is an investment. But once again, if you're gonna invest, this is the portion of equipment that I recommend investing your money in because it is gonna give you a quality pizza out of your home oven. Next, we have what you're gonna load your pizza with, different types of peels. Um, these are used differently. Um, if Depending on how, what kind of pizza you're making and a Neapolitan pizza, I would recommend preparing it on this kind of wooden peel. If you notice, there's a little bit of a lip here it's about a half inch when it's all said and done. It is difficult to slide a pizza onto a peel like that unless the level you're working, um, your working bench is at, at different levels. So if it's, if your bench is here and your peel is here and you can slide it on evenly, go for it. If not, I recommend prepping your pizza right on these. You lightly flour it and we're gonna show some uh, examples of how we do that later on in the video today. Another one, is just a regular peel. Most people have seen these. You can use these for, you know, they use them for bread making as well too. Nice and thin, sit right on your workbench, 
slide your pizza right on it or shoot that right underneath your pizza with a little bit of flour on there and you're ready to go. It slides right off when you put it into the oven. So you can see how thin that is. Big difference in the, uh, in the thickness of the oven and really used differently. These you have to be very quick with. They heat up very fast. If you're having problems getting that thing in the oven and, and getting it going, it may end up sticking to this. So we'll talk about that or work, uh, work on that a little bit today when we make some pizza and see what happens. Maybe we'll get a pizza stuck to it, I don't know. Ladles, different size ladles for different types of pizzas. Neapolitan, New York style pizzas and Neapolitan pizzas, I recommend like a two ounce ladle. You don't wanna go more than that. You're gonna get that pizza really soggy. Um, whenever you're making your Detroit style, Chicago style, uh, even Roman style, where you're sprinkling a little bit more on top of it, you can go to a three ounce or four and a half, four ounce. I wouldn't recommend going more than that as well too. So here we have some, look like putty knives. These are spatulas for removing dough. These are actually for pizza. Um, they are not your regular putty knives from Home Depot. So uh, you purchase these and these help you scoop up your, your dough balls and we'll uh, show examples of that in a little bit. We have bench scrapers. Keep your bench clean, help you scrape up a pizza, pizza ball if you need to as well. And then we have our pizza cutter. Most people have these at home. Can opener for the big cans, very important. We have an instant read thermometer, check your dough temperature. We also have a infrared thermometer, check your oven, check your stone. Make sure it's at the right temperature, the temperature you want before you start cooking. And that's gonna be very important. If it's too cold, pizza's not gonna come out the way you want it. If it's too hot, you're gonna burn that bottom. Something to slide your pizza on, prep it. Just a little pizza pan. A cooling rack, most everybody has these at home. Get your pizza out there, throw it on the cooling rack. That allows some of that steam to dissipate from top and bottom so you get that crust that you want. Books, 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 books. These are very, very important. Get your hands on any book you can about pizza, read up, um, anything on, on baking. You all have this, and we're all gonna be using this today, highlighting a lot of different um, definitions and different ways of doing things inside. Um, and this, this book is very important, it's a great book. I've used it a couple of times um, whenever I've been stuck. These are a little bit more of the professional type peels. This is um, a, this, this one here allows more of the flour to fall through. It's been, basically it's perforated, I guess you, you could say. Um, but this allows for easier loading and unloading of the pizza, removing excess flour from that pizza so that you're not gonna be cooking any of the extra pizza you're using to, to slide, I mean, uh, flour that you're slide when, whenever you slide it in there. So once again, hey, let's try that again. So you're gonna slide your pizza on here. All the excess flour slides off, throw it in there. That flour is now in on the floor. It's not in there with your pizza. Pizza tastes better. Ho hopefully that made sense. This is a pizza peel as well too. It's used to turn your pizza whenever you're cooking in a wood-fired oven. So to keep you from having to reach in there, get your hand firm, you're gonna work that pizza from here. It's just a turning motion. This is in place here, in place of a rag. You can also use a rag to keep your hand cool. Remember, you're gonna go into a very hot oven up to a thousand degrees at times. If you pull that back out, it's already hot. This allows you to work it. So very, very important to have this. If you don't have this, grab a rag, use a rag instead. But this is what you would turn your pizza with inside of a wood burning or a gas fired oven that is brick. So those are magic. Those are some of the tools that are needed whenever you're making pizza. So we're gonna run through that quickly. There's nothing else that I see here. Um, I think that's most of our equipment that we're gonna go. Let's start making dough and let's start making pizza so we can eat some pizza today. All right, we're getting ready to make some dough. Some things I wanna touch on. A scale, digital scale as part of your equipment. Some spatulas, I got my scrapers. 
and then just random containers however you want to use it we're going to be using a mixer today so you can do this all by hand or you can do it by mixer the process we're going to be using today is once again a neapolitan inspired actually this is uh neapolitan style this is the way i learned to make pizza so um usually you would add salt in with your flour we're going to do a little bit different now i've weighed this out but typically if you're just working out of random containers of water or whatever just zero out your scale i'm going to add my water we're looking at 568 grams of water i'm going to add that first next zero it out we want to grab our salt here we are at 27 grams of salt, zero it out. We're gonna get that in there. Now I know when it comes to baking, a lot of people say you can't do this because it's gonna retard the yeast process. I've yet to find that to be true, but I'm not pickling anything either. So we're just gonna get this in here and we're gonna go quickly Dissolve it with our hands. Get in there with your clean hands. Rake that salt up. All right. The water can be room temperature. I like to use a little bit colder water because the mixing process heats that dough up. And I'm trying to keep my dough at about just a little bit below 80 degrees so it doesn't start proofing too fast. I want to control that process. The method we're doing today is a, it's called a direct method. Um, instead of going in stages where we would pre-ferment um, by adding our yeast um, for 24 hours and then adding that um, to a foolish with a starter or however you want to do that and then adding it to your, your bulk dough. Uh, that's three steps, 72 hours. That's an indirect method. We're just going to do a direct method today just because um, we're gonna show you how to make a, a, a dough that you can start in the morning and 12 hours later it'll be ready for you to cook. This process, it kind of compromises the taste a little bit in my opinion, because the longer you allow it to settle in and develop, the tastier it is and the, the texture is different as well too, but this is a great, great dough to make for a same day pizza. And we'll talk about the steps as we go through it. The next thing I would add would be yeast. This is my preferred yeast. If I'm gonna use yeast, this is a cake yeast or a fresh yeast. The next one is active dry yeast. And this is what it looks like here out of the container. Both commercial yeast. Um, this is much more flavorable to me. Um, I'm gonna use a sourdough that I've grown myself. Sourdough or a starter, they're covered on pages 172 to 173. And you're on baking um, this is my starter this has been with me for about two years now um, you can see it's when I fed it about six hours ago it was about to here it's doubled up one of the things you can do with a starter to see if it's ready you can put that into your water if it floats it lets you know it's ready so usually within four to six hours at room temperature your starter will bubble up this is sourdough this is what's going to give you that sourdough flavor um, it changes the complexity of your um, your final product. It gives it a, the flavor is different, the texture is uh, different, but this is going to um, have to be taken care of on the front end. You can't just add your flour and water and it's ready within a day. Once again, go back to your book, teaches you how to make that and get it ready. But like I said, I've had this for several years. This is my go-to and I'm gonna add that instead of yeast today. There are a lot of recipes where you can do both. You just have to change your baker's percentage and adjust for that. But a pinch of this with a pinch of yeast and you're good to go. You're going to allow your flour to rise, um, your dough to rise, and you're still going to have the flavor. So today we're just going to use my, uh, my sourdough. One of the things I need to mention is you do not want to do a lot of mixing on top of your scale. It's going to mess up your sensor. So once I add this, I'm gonna get an idea of how much I'm adding. I'm gonna use a, I will probably use about 12 grams of this. 
there's no set um, real standard for that. It really depends on how much flavor you want to add and how fast you want your, uh, your final dough to rise. So this is what it looks like. A little bit runny, almost like it has some gluten strands already developed into it. And the makeup of this is a, and it's floating now, so. Add a little bit more. And this is a 100% hydration, which means equal parts flour and water. But once again, you need to get into your book, read that, learn how to make it, start making that on your own. If you can find a local starter that you want to use as your mother starter, um, go for it. I don't recommend purchasing them online or getting them from websites because once you open that up and start feeding it locally, it's going to take on the flavors of the yeast that you have uh, locally. So it makes no difference. And the next thing I do, I just get in here with my hands again. I'm just going to break it down. And then you're just going to end up having, I wish I could show this, I'm not sure if that camera catches that, but you can see it looks like a thinned out milk. So get that going. All right. So that's that process. And remember, that skips the step of adding the yeast. Um, if I wanted to add a little bit of yeast, it, I could just take a pinch here. I can break off a small portion for me because I know at this at this measurement six grams I mean uh, six piece, six pieces at 250 grams sorry about that <laughs> it's a ring off my off my gear and I can just go ahead and melt that in here and that's as simple as that there's really nothing to that Now that is gonna activate much faster so that I have to really babysit this dough since I added the additional yeast to it with that starter. So I'm gonna have that sourdough flavor acting as a yeast and then this cake yeast as well too. So you just it's something you definitely wanna watch. The next step is adding our flour. Um, I would usually take this out, but what we're gonna do, we're gonna add everything to the bowl now and then I'm gonna gradually add the flour. I've already measured that flour out to 900 grams. What we are gonna do, we're gonna auto-release this. So we're not gonna add the entire amount all at once. I'm gonna probably add about 75% of the flour. We're gonna mix it for about two minutes, get it mixed up, and we're gonna let it sit for 20 minutes from there. We'll come back after 20 minutes, it'll be relaxed. We'll run it again for the actual kneading process. And at that point, we'll have a good idea of where we stand with our dough and what we need to do with it. And we'll add the remaining 25% or so of the flour. So. Um, yeah, we'll come back to you on that. Ready to start adding the flour. Um, once again, this has been pre-measured. We're at 900 grams. We're going to add about 75% of it. We're going to let that rest after about a minute or two of mixing. And it's going to be the auto lease process. Uh, more on the auto lease process, very, very, very important portion of uh, making bread and especially uh, pizza um, in this case. There, there are different ways of doing it. Typically when you're making bread, you're not gonna add all your ingredients and, and, and do the auto lease process. Here for the pizza, we're adding all our ingredients for the Neapolitan inspired. We're gonna auto lease it and then we just go from there. So bread, it's a different process. I, I get it, I understand. Um, if you, it's kind of confusing to people. If, if you've heard it the other way, we're making Neapolitan pizza and that's the way we're gonna do it today. So we're gonna get that started. Basically start your mixer here. And I'm gonna slowly add, I mean, I've got, it's on the uh, slowest setting. Start my little timer. Very important not to add it in all at once. I'm letting that water capture that flour. Start pulling it from the sides. Add another scoop. 
watching my timer because I want to take my time adding it in, but I don't want this process to go five minutes. And this is where a quality mixer comes in very handy. Assist, spatula, and we're getting there now. And what this process is going to do, that all at least after you read about it, this what it's going to actually do is going to hydrate your flour and create a better dough all around, flavor wise and texture wise. Using that starter that I use also aids in that and it also changes the digestibility of the flour. It's a highly digestible flour. If the longer you allow it to rest, if you're using a, a Polish method or a Vega method, along with the auto lease, your, your dough is gonna be highly digestible. So now we're at about a minute 30. We're almost where we wanna be with our flour. Final scoop here. I'm gonna let this go for about another 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So we're gonna once we start the auto lease process, we're gonna cover it up with a towel. We're gonna let it rest for 20 minutes. During that 20 minutes, um, I think we're gonna come back and we'll make our sauce for the pizza, and then uh, we'll do the final mix, which is usually about an eight-minute mix, uh, right around the same speed. And then uh, we can form the dough balls and we'll make some pizza today. So, yep, that's about it. All right, added something to the board. We're at the um, auto lease portion now. Added something to the board. The flour that we're using today is a bread flour. It's a higher protein flour um, than your traditional Neapolitan pizza. You're, typically, you're gonna be using a zero zero flour, much more expensive flour, much more delicate flour. But for the home oven, you're gonna get better results, in my opinion, if you're using a bread flour. Higher um, protein level, it's a little bit tougher flouring sport. And it's um, more conducive for that longer cook period. In a Neapolitan brick oven, or a, an Italian brick oven, or French brick oven, the cook time is anywhere from 55 seconds to 90 seconds. We're gonna be cooking our pizzas anywhere around eight minutes to 12 minutes, depending on the oven. That's more like New York style pizza cook time. So. That's one of the things I wanted to add in here. So we're using bread flour for this recipe today just because we're using that our, our home ovens. So let's talk sauce. Um, traditional Neapolitan sauce is going to be plum tomatoes, basil, and salt. And that's it. Now that doesn't mean you can't add whatever you want to your sauce. And I recommend you add it to taste. I like it like this. I enjoy it like this. Um, but add whatever you want to add. Um, New York style sauces add a little bit of the Italian seasoning and garlic or onion powder. That's kind of a big deal there. And it makes for a fantastic sauce as well too. But kind of sticking true to the roots of the Neapolitan pizza, we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna go ahead. We've got our plum tomatoes in here now. Just a bunch of basil that we've rinsed off, cleaned up every piece in there, a little bit of salt, and salt that to taste, okay? We'll use our immersion blender, get it in here, and now, one of the things, we do not want to do this too long. The, the, the longer you use immersion blender, the more liquid you're going to push out of those tomatoes, and then you're going to have a very wet sauce. So, and we're not going to cook this sauce, this sauce is going to go straight on our pizza, so you need to be careful. You want to just give it a couple of good bursts here and there. Stir it up a little bit. You'll see some of those tomatoes come up in chunks. Once that basil is broken up, those plum tomatoes are broken up, and that's about it. Here's a big chunk here. That's it. That's all you're going to want to do. You're not going to really want to add too much liquid 
with the immersion blender from those tomatoes. So it's still kind of thick. It's got a little bit of liquid on the top here, but it's a nice thick consistency. That's what you're looking for when you're making tomatoes. The longer you blend it, the more liquid you're going to get out of it. Um, it's going to be, it's going to make for a difficult pizza to handle and just the flavor is not there as well too. So you want to enjoy those tomatoes and that's it. That's how you make your sauce. No cooking, go straight on the pizza and it cooks in the oven. All right, it's been about 20 minutes of the all release process. The dough has hydrated up. It's pretty relaxed. We're gonna add our remaining 25%. Mix it probably for about anywhere six to eight minutes. Take a look at it. Once it starts shaping up into a ball, not just necessarily cleaning the side of the ball. I know people talk about that all the time. You want it to start forming. Um, and once it starts forming into a, a ball in there and that hook isn't just ripping through it, and it starts hanging onto that, um, hanging onto the hook and moving around with it, It'll shape about three separate balls in there as, as that hook is moving. You'll kind of know that it's ready. We'll have a, I'll pull it out and let you see what that looks like as well too. But we're going to go ahead and start the next process. And this is the next step past the auto lease process. Adding the remaining flour, running it for about six minutes to eight minutes, monitoring how our dough looks and going from there. So. Once again, I'm going to slowly add that flour in. I'm not too aggressive with the way I add the flour at this point. I want to be patient. I want to let the mixer do its thing. I want the dough to start coming to life. And if I don't need the last few grams of my flour, I don't add it in. I just watch what's happening. I kind of monitor the dough. And that's just gonna come with time and experience. The, the more you do it, the more you're gonna learn um, when your dough is ready and you'll get a feel for it. But don't be, don't feel that it's necessary just to dump all this flour right back into it. That's, that's not the case. I can tell by the noise that I need to add some more flour in right now. And inside my bowl right now, it's the sides are actually clean. It's, it's taking all of the flour off the sides. And typically in baking, they tell you that's when you're about ready um, to, to take your dough out of the mixer. Not necessarily true for whenever we're making pizza dough. So this is gonna go for probably about another six to eight minutes. And after six to eight minutes, I'm gonna pull it out. We're gonna work it by hand a little bit. I'll show you a couple of different techniques for hand kneading just to finish off the dough and then uh, we'll roll some dough balls and then uh, we'll make some pizza. All right, so here's our dough. Now, after probably about 15 minutes in the mixer, you can see that it's changed. It's very soft, it's workable. Um, some of the techniques you can use whenever you're doing um, kneading by hand. Uh, I don't recommend a bunch of bench flour. You can use a little bit. I'll use a little bit of warm water on my, on my hands and it just keeps it from sticking. And I'm not introducing a lot of flour. I can deal with that a little bit more hydration. I don't like dealing with a lot more flour. Uh, and it really depends on how sticky it is and what the temperature is like inside your kitchen that day, what the temperature of the dough is after it comes out of the mixer. But this is the look we're looking for. You can see it's got real good gluten development. And we're actually gonna introduce some more gluten in, into it here in a minute. But some of the techniques, whenever you're doing pizza, you can just kind of stretch it out pull it back, turn it, same thing. You can start seeing that. It's already creating a real smooth gluten skin. But those are some of the techniques. Neapolitan, they like to punch it in, get a bunch of air into it, and then, excuse the noise here. Put this aside. This is a technique where you can slam it down, kind of Curl it over, you're capturing air in there, turn it, doing the same thing. And that's really good with a high hydration dough that's hard to work with. Probably about five minutes of that. 
and it'll form up real nice and tight and it'll no longer be sticky. But if, if it is, just get your hands in some water here. And start working it. But we're not gonna work this much more. It's already at a point, at a real good point where it's getting a nice tight skin on it. So you can take one of your scrapers Start forming the ball here. And I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about a technique and then we're going to show you another technique here. Um, we're going to let this rest for 15 minutes on the bench. I'm going to cover it up and I'm going to come back and do a coil fold. Um, and what that does, it allows uh, the stronger gluten development to develop in this thing. So um, if you're going to do a, um, a one day uh, dough or if you're going to do a 72 hour dough, if you're going to let this Typically what I would do now that I have my bulk, I would let it ferment. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I let it proof now and it's gonna be 24 hours later. I would cut it up into dough balls and then it would sit for another 24 hours. But since we're gonna make a one day pizza, this is our bulk dough ball here. We're gonna give it some more love. We're gonna cover it up, come back in about 15 minutes. It's gonna expand a little bit. We're gonna do a coil and fold, cover it up for another 15 minutes and then, then we can ball it up and get it ready um, to cook once all that doubles up in size which probably about eight hours you don't want to go more than 12 hours of it sitting um, on your counter i think it's going to overproof at that time once again i recommend longer uh, proofing times you know 24 hours 48 hours 72 hours but since we're making a same day dough you can see how that's kind of springing back it's ready to go now and it's keeping that nice uh gluten gluten skin but if you're doing the same day dough i'll just show you an additional technique you can add to it and you can add this to your 72 hour um, proof as well too. Just it's going to be just one more technique we're going to add. So we're going to cover this up, give it 15 minutes and I'll have some some dough ready for you that we're going to be able to ball up here in a second. All right so we've been at about 15 minutes of it resting underneath that pan and this is just an extra step I'm just going to show you here. If you're kneading by hand, I say absolutely a must. If you are just wanting to get some extra gluten in there and try this technique, just a coil and fold. And you're gonna just wet your hands with some warm water, not too much, just like that. Get underneath it, spread it out, and just lay it over itself. Right there. If you can again, if it's loose enough, just again, right there. And that's it, and that just really adds a little bit more to it. And can come out here, bring that ball back. And you can see, hopefully you can see on camera what it's doing here. But real nice skin, it's bouncing right back. So that's a quantum fold, and like I said, absolutely necessary, in my opinion, if you're gonna need by hand. Majority of your kneading is done by hand. I would absolutely do this. Um, and then it doesn't hurt just to do it once um, when you're using a mixer. But if you're getting the results you want from your mixer, not a necessity. If you're doing it by hand, I say absolutely a necessity. And then I would store this. So this will go in a, I've got a six quart container here. It go in here for 24 hours. And then I would pull it out, roll it into dough balls, let it rest for another 24 hours. Or if you're gonna do the same day, let it double in size. It's probably going to be about four hours on your countertop in the kitchen, depending on the temperature, how six hours maybe. Um, and at that point, you're going to want to roll into a dough ball. You can, if you're going to use it the same day, roll them into dough balls now. That's going to be up to you. At that point, you're going to want to watch your dough ball, make sure that it proofs, doubles up in size in a, in a container or whatever you're going to keep them in. But that is the process. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So at this point, I'll take it, put it in my container, and then I'll let it rest. So seal that up. And then you're gonna get something like this. This is where I started with that. That's where, wasn't the dome, it was just the edge, where the edge was touching was at that line there. So the dome was higher, but that's what I'm looking at. So that's, that's the growth, and it's been sitting at room temperature. Now after 24 hours of, um, proofing as a bulk proof it's been sitting in the at room temperature for about three hours 
and this is what we have out of it. This one is made with sourdough and flour that I mill for my Polish. So it's a little bit different process, a little bit more of an advanced process, but I mill my own flour for the Polish to get a different uh, level of gluten, different level of flour strength, but still gonna be the same thing. You're gonna wanna, here it actually tripled in size roughly, so that's a pretty good proof. And then we're gonna open this up and roll into dough balls and we'll go from there. All right, so this is the flour that had already proofed, I mean the, the dough that had already proofed. We're just gonna cut it into some workable sizes here. Just something I like to do. And we're gonna roll some dough balls. And we're shooting for 250 grams. Um, you know, a little bit above, a little bit below. Try not to use too much flour. Just a little bit to keep it from sticking to you. Get your scale ready. And then a couple of techniques. There's the, you can roll it here and just work it into a dough ball using your basically pinky finger to push it back in. Give it a good squeeze. Just take your thumb, give it a squeeze, take your thumb, push it, and then just rip it out. So you're gonna scoop it out. So almost like making mozzarella. You squeeze it, take your thumb, just rip it out. That's one of the techniques. Just a little bit more than 250 there. And then you can come in, roll it, take your pinky and your thumb, and you're just kind of working it in. You're trying to get a good seal on the bottom. So another way of doing it is taking your fingers, pinky fingers in your hand, and pulling that gluten skin tight and just rolling it a little bit. It's one of the techniques you can do as well too. So that'll look like this. You're here, and then just roll it. Still open a little bit right there. Take that, pull that skin tight. A little bit there, you push it in. I'm just gonna put it down in your pan. So here's another way of doing it if you're just trying to measure it out first and go that way. It's 250 there. Just work it together again. This one, get it together, bring it, seal it, turn it, get those edges, bring them in, seal them. And all you're doing is bringing the edges together, closing them. And you're gonna have that left there. Pinch it, twist, keeping that gig glued skin on there. And then just roll. Make your pinky do the work there. Just kind of pushing that dough back to the center. And get a good little dough ball. So we'll do one more. Just off of this. And just kind of incorporate all the techniques. Get this rolled up. Not sticking here on the bottom side. That's where that is. It's a little bit light, so let's incorporate all the techniques. Perfect. So now we're going to take that. Come here. Now, one of the things I didn't mention is it may look like I'm being rough with this dough. I'm not. I may be moving fast, but I'm very gentle with this dough. I do not want to destroy all the work that we put into this, and that is getting rid of the air, overworking it, adding too much bench flour, that kind of stuff. But I'm also, if I'm working fast, doesn't mean I'm being rough with it. You, get, you have to be gentle with this, at this portion as well too, of the dough making process. So and that's it. So one of the techniques in your hand, you can kind of do it again as well too. You can feel that bottom close up in your hand as you're pushing it back and forth. You can do it here with your pinky, there's this technique. You kind of bring your hands together, stretch that skin, and then seal it, and then just roll it as well too. So 250 gram balls, I'll finish the rest of these, and then we're gonna go ahead and cook, make some pizza. 
Okay, in the kitchen now, uh, we're gonna get ready to uh, make a couple pizzas. So the oven has been set up. Our pizza stones are inside there. You may be able to see the reflection there. There's the ceramic, there's the steel, and then the lodge is down here below. In this pan here, I've got some of the flour that I used to make the pizza with, and then I've added some semolina flour. So you'll see that the color has changed a little bit. It's a little bit more of a, a yellow tint to it. These are some dough balls that I had made already. I've got two types of them with the whole whole wheat. And you add that flour liberally to it. It's gonna look something like that. You wanna get flour in between these creases here as it as it's come together because we are now going to take our spatula, go into that crease. Separate it on all sides, including the side here that is on the dough tray. Again, a little bit in front of it, and you're going to shoot this underneath really fast and commit it. You just commit to it, get underneath there, and then pull that out. You're going to put that in your flour. Go ahead and turn it a couple of times in that flour. Try to get all that excess out. You don't need that much with this. Sometimes a higher hydration dough, you're going to need a little bit more. So come in here. And we can do a traditional Neapolitan style kind of press. We're going to just use the pads of our fingers. And we're just going to push that air. You can see that air moving off to the side there. We're going to do that again. I'll just turn it so for the camera. See that? All right, this one's got a lot of air. It's been sitting at room temperature for a while and now that we're in the kitchen it's hot in here so it's starting to relax and proof out a little bit more so here we go and that's all you're doing and you're trying to avoid a lot of contact with the edges um, it's inevitable once you start making it but you don't want to smash the edges since we are making that neapolitan style uh, we're making a bar style pizza, New York style pizza, even New York style, I don't recommend touching the edges too much. Um, as long as there's no sauce on there, it's always gonna bubble up, but I want there to be actual texture in here, some crumb instead of just air, okay? Flip that over. Right now you can see it's not really sticking to my countertop, it's just loose. And then some of the other techniques just to get it opened up on the back of the knuckles, you can stretch it out. One of the techniques when you're first starting out with pizza you can see it starts becoming a, a lot of pizza and then you get these big air air bubbles you can just kind of take that out of it it'll just char in a wood fired oven it's just going to char in a home oven it's just going to become an air pocket and then you can also a little bit of the neapolitan style and i'll just go slow there all i'm doing is Pulling it and stretching, turning it a quarter turn at a time. It's a quarter turn at a time just to keep that even shape that I want of my pizza. And that kind of opens it up. So it would look like. Okay. Now we're here. Take your two ounce or whatever your preference is. I like two ounce sauce. Get it on there. Spread that out. I like pecorino, so I'll go pecorino directly on it. Here's some quality mozzarella. Regardless of the mozzarella you use, the difficult portion of it is if you're going to add the mozzarella to the pizza in a home oven with a longer cook, you're going to get a little bit more of that New York topping where it's somewhat separated, it's browned a little bit. For Neapolitan, that's not really what you're looking for. For New York style, it's okay. And you're gonna kinda get a little bit of a blend of that. You're gonna get that here. And we just have a couple of other cheeses we're gonna add to this one. It's whatever you like. A little bit of Parmesan. 
You can add some olive oil at this point right now. Since it's a long cook, I prefer not to add the olive oil. I really don't want to fry that top any faster um, than it's going to. I don't want to cook that cheese any faster than it needs to be cooked. And, and that's what the olive oil will do. If you're using a some kind of a, a wood fire or a coal where they're using a barbecue grill, um, you can at that point do that. Try to keep the sauce off the edges. Try to keep the sauce out of the middle. Those are the two things. You want to spread it evenly, but away from the edges. And if I do get it on the edges, that typically won't, um, I, I won't get the oven spring that I'm looking for out of it. So clear some of this off. Take a little bit of that dust, a little bit of dust from my flour mix. Right, and I can just work it on there. Pull my pizza up, and traditional Neapolitan style, I'm gonna form it on my peel. Stretch it out a little bit more, get it going. Put a piece of cheese here. And that's it. So now we're gonna go ahead and put it in the oven. So going in the oven took a couple of shakes, stick with it, try to not stay in there very long because you don't want this aluminum to get hot, it's gonna start cooking to it. However, I didn't wanna just shoot this in there and have my pizza slide across the back of my pizza stone and uh, have a big mess, which will happen. So it's a little bit of a technique. You wanna come in there, get level, shake your pizza out if you can, get in there and pull it out if you can, but if it's not coming out, you don't want to get too rough because in a home oven, you do that, that pizza, if it's nice and slick underneath, is going to go right off the back end and into the bottom of your oven. And then you have a whole different um, pizza to deal with. So that's uh, that's throwing a pizza in. We're going to watch this for a few minutes. I'll pull it out, let you, uh, let you take a look at it, and then uh, we'll just have some other footage of uh, making some more, uh, some more pizzas and stretching out the dough balls. But that's the stretching technique. And, so that's, that's where I'm talking about. You put in so much work on the front end, you don't want to skimp on the back end with cheap ingredients and cheap um, equipment. You want to get quality stuff because you take so much time doing this. This is where all the flavor comes together so you can enjoy it. So we'll uh, see what the pizza looks like here in a few minutes. Probably about eight minutes and we'll pull it out. So that was about five minutes, and you can see the color change. Um, it got nice and puffy, Neapolitan style. It's a little bit crispier than what would come in or come out of a wood fired oven. That cheese is completely melted. Add a little bit of olive oil, some basil. Add your little extra Parmesan if you want. But as we said in the beginning, this is a Neapolitan inspired pizza. Um, we're not going to get all of the attributes of a true Neapolitan pizza, but we're hoping for the flavor, some of that texture to come out of that home oven. So put it on your sheet here so this takes the steam from the bottom and the top. It doesn't get soggy going straight onto a plate. And that's what you have so you can still see that nice give there you can hear it it comes right back it's not just a cracker and breaking so there you have it